trying. Okay. So, of course, as usual, I, 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 I'm Adam Zaretsky, by the way. Um, as usual, I, pre I prepared for an hour's talk, but I'll, I'll do what I can in, in 20 minutes. Um, Ten. Ten. Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, this is Hub. Uh, I, I actually quite enjoy Hub. We talk a lot. Um, uh, he's, he's helped me a lot to um, get involved with biosolar cells. And nonetheless, I am quite critical. And so the name of my talk today is Almost Organic. Um, this is the interface between solar cells and algae, or the organisms that may live inside of our nano uh, collectors in the future. Um, I'm mostly interested in uh, human germline engineering. So uh, in utero, gene therapy is a, a gateway drug to re-engineering the human genome. Um, but I do like to work in labs and actually understand protocols. And I've done some of that. Uh, we, we have applied for one of these difficult to get uh, yet more permissible, yet more chaotically risky permits. And we will see uh, if our organisms get through, they will be housed here in the little museum. Um, for bioart, just so you know, uh, a live organism on display is the best thing. We have some live organisms. A live GMO in, in this exhibition's context would be great. Uh, because it's altered, and then um, public hands-on or even performance of alteration by the public really gives them a taste, not necessarily to promote genetic engineering, but actually to get people to know at least what it feels like to alter an organism in the lab or in a public sphere. Um, for me, it's ancestor rape, but, um, but I tend to like to do it. So what does that tell you about me? Um, as far as bio-based uh, industry, one thing, maybe it's because it's the first word and I sometimes don't read all the way through, but reindustrialize Europe and all of uh, Europeans, you know, European friends around the world that can grow GM crops and set up biofermentators for that. Um, that is neocolonialism uh, and reindustrialization. And we're, we're dressing this up as a sustainable thing, so we're we're reintroducing industrialization and uh, trying to amp up production, albeit with a lower CO2 impact or footprint. Um, this is still a sort of cover the earth with plastic maneuver. Um, I think that mutation, on the other hand, is kind of natural. I'm happy about these elbows. Um, I do agree with Paul that we don't know what we're doing. Um, on the level of metabolism and physiology, on the level of gene interaction, on the level of body plan, on the level of long-term deep time. But that might be okay because although we're anthropocentric and we think that if there's risk, as long as there's benefit, which equals profit, um, <laughs> quarterly profit equals benefit, then the risk is allayed. That's anthropocentrism. But um, if we don't know what we're doing, then we're making jazz. And uh, that, if you don't mind um, a, a version of nature that's not so pastoral, then I'm sure you won't mind a version of art that's not either. Um, on the other hand, when the public hears that we're going to increase photosynthesis and make super algae, they think of invasion of the body snatchers. Right? They think that these, these algae will take over the earth. We're actually, we should be working only with ourselves and enhancing ourselves only and leave the plants and the animals, we'll give them back like half of the landmass of the world, like Peter was talking about, and only work on ourselves, maybe contain ourselves too. Um, but uh, there is a reason, and maybe it's pop culture, this like growing plants day of the triffids, when people hear that we're going to be enhancing algae before ourselves, aren't we giving them a head start? Um, there's Food of the Gods by H.G. Wells, which predicted that um, bigger plants would make bigger bees, right? Um, and Godzilla versus Biolante, much ignored, but Biolante is this sort of rose tissue culture that escapes from the lab and grows. And luckily, there's this nuclear monster. Anyhow, not to delay the point, some of these fears are not just paranoia, okay? There really are algaes that produce phytotoxins. And even the algaes that we deem safe because they don't have genes for phytotoxins can revert just like E. coli to things like cholera, et cetera. It does happen. That's why 
containment was invented in the 70s, Asilomar, just to, for people that remember history. Um, people do have toxic um, responses. You know, they stop breathing when they, when they swim in this. And certainly, the coasts of Florida have had humongous die-offs even before the BP spill. Here's an algae bloom in Lago Atitlan that you can see from space. Uh, that's in Guatemala. Um, I don't know what the writers of the Popol Vuh have to say about it, but um, there is, I'm, I'm not making this up, the CDC is worried about harmful algae blooms. They call them HABs, okay? So we have to think about what we're doing because life itself is fundamentally uncontained. And algae grown in the oceans, whether or not we go with Craig Ventner's West Coast Americana idea of open pools is cool, or we go with containment and wait for someone to uh, sort of like crack a pipe. Um, we do have to think about this. Um, I didn't know, Peter Fend, your ocean earth. I love you guys. Um, algae blooms can grow as big as Denmark overnight. Okay, so from, from small comes big. Uh, and there are scientists who are worried, okay, just because we've heard a lot of scientists aren't that worried. Um, there are some scientists, they don't get funding from Exxon to be worried, okay? But there is fundamental research and there are scientists who don't follow corporate path. Um, and this is a red tide. To me, it's very beautiful, you know? Um, it's a flesh skin on the ocean. It's actually like a, a, a living skin. Um, but I, I like to think about even developing bioweapons. You know, if we're gonna develop if we're going to develop algae that produces food, feedstock for animals and pharmaceuticals, and we're going to burn it, you know, we have to also think about uh, other uses for it. And it's a, it's a really quick way to make bioweapons. Um, now, this is Algae Park over in Wacheningen, and I went there for the opening. I had some talk there, and this is an open pool, right? It's a raceway, and I don't know if that's GM algae in there, but I could tell you it's not. It's not, no way, huh? Um, but uh, this is the kind of uh, open pool system that we might worry about a duck landing in and then going to the next freshwater place or these ocean. Um, just so you know, when I read, I can read scientific papers pretty well as an absurdist, but sometimes I translate them to scientists. This is what most people see when they look at your papers, right? Just so you know, they have another thing going as far as perception. Um, but. Ooh, look at that. But when we come to fueling this bio-based economy, we, we sort of are looking at uh, not just this, but like a sort of, how do you say, a pretty good um, campaign. This would be a big open pool that people can walk on. It's a park, and it's a fermentation plant, and it produces pharmaceuticals. So we could have like Prozac gas. Why don't we burn Prozac and make it airborne out of the back of our cars without carbon emission? That sounds good. Um, and I'm not, this is Unilever's sort of like way of saying it, right? Which is that we're going to take sugarcane, ferment it, make it into plastic, but it's going to be green, right? So we're reselling plastic back to ourselves in a new green package. I don't know. I don't know. It looks good on paper. Um, I'm looking at it from being inside of like a clean room as a bioterrorist hanging out with American federal postal workers. So, you know, that's me. Um, so I, I, I had to respond a little bit. I made this icon, and it has to do with um, all the corporations that are funding me. And you can see these biohazard symbols and the Jesus fish in there, because we've micro-injected algae into, you know, uh, glass or ghost Casper, ghost zebrafish. And also, the stomach is up here. The um, destabilized euro symbol is hidden in here, as well as Cthulhu the swamp monster eating humans, um, and obviously the oil thing that we're responding to. Um, one thing that I would say is what gets my goat a little bit is that it's business as usual in the name of like a sort of green, purposeful, we want, we don't just want the world to survive, we want Western civilization to survive. And so now the Navy has a green fleet, right? Um, the idea is that some of their boats and planes can run on biofuel and maybe even algae biofuel, and that includes the F-18s that take off of the deck, right? Um, you can see on the side of this, it says, it has a little green stripe in there and it says energy security, right? So we are perpetuating 
a sort of like aerial bombing of people that don't agree with our, our ideology, um, but in a green, sustainable way. Um, and I, I would say energy security is important, so is silence, right? So I'm maybe the wrong guy for the job, but um, here's Obama okaying that F-18, so, and here's some of the bombs. I don't see why we wouldn't also make our bombs sustainable, right? So actually we can, we can build explosives in these plants. There's really no reason why not. We saw this flame on the ocean, right? So why wouldn't we make these bombs so that they don't, they have like a zero carbon net effect um, to support Western civilization? It's very important that this survives because we've been going this way for some time and it's working. Um, like texting or sexting, it's working. I also, I, I think I said it at the opening, um, I'm not that into patenting or ownership. I believe in the creative commons, but if no one's patented um, green napalm, I'm in because as an artist, that's cynical and sort of like, um, it's quirvy enough that I don't see why we wouldn't make a sort of uh, gel, right? So I want the patent for that. And I'm, 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 I might sit on it, but you know, it's about hit after hit, right? We gotta make it work. And when it comes to green napalm, um, I guess I would just have to add that although it's a defoliant, it's used mostly to melt people. Um, but uh, that we are working, some of us artists are working in this sort of like, I don't know how to say it. It's a notion of expenditure that we humans are actually entropic devices without minds that we're actually powered by the sun to destroy, um, to build up. We come together in this form to actually decimate and, and explode energy. And this is from George Bataille, who had this fabulous idea that we were, we were like volcanoes responding to the sun shitting on us. The sun shits light on us. It's actually like excess. And we respond by trying to uh, have a sacrificial uh, warlike nature that um, explodes back at the sun, right? Almost in competition, almost uh, castrated by the enormity of the expenditure that the sun is able to offer. That's what sacrifice is. And so from a sacrificial nation, um, I'm trying to figure out how to use this biomass to continue this fantastic, fantastic giving light to the world, right? We, like the sun, are giving light. Um, now, I have to say, on the other hand, I prefer this woman who's been melted by napalm to this sort of Nikki napalm pinup kind of neo 50s look. Okay, I actually prefer the mutants over um, the wild types. Uh, although I would agree with Peter Fend, we need to go ahead and give back the, at least a third of the landmass of the world to non humans. Um, when it comes to human integrity, human integrity is based on something really, really odd. Giant, giant, amorphous frontal lobes. Um, and so in this exhibition, you'll see the results of some experiments. One was giving the public a hands-on chance to micro-inject algae into zebrafish embryos. And this is so that the zebrafish would maybe go into a forced symbiosis with the algae and be able to be solar powered. Eventually maybe humans could be solar powered um, and that would be fantastic. We would just cut out the middleman altogether. We could just grow sort of bat-like appendages and lay back and be human hammocks and not need to burn oil. <laughs> anyway, the public actually doesn't really respond like this. First they do it and then they respond like this. And that's kind of interesting. Um, just so you know, it's not totally an unnatural act. It, it exists, uh, sea slugs, there are some sea slugs that go ahead and utilize this algae, uh, even steal the chloroplasts and become more photosynthetic and don't really need their mouth as much. And there are people that also want to put fish inside themselves, right? And although this seems unnatural, it's much like genetic engineering. It's a xeno transplantation in a way. Um, and I would remind you that this is a trial here. I don't mean to dwell on this, but on the left here is a trial run of this fecal transplantation that was done here in the Netherlands, which cures people. So it's, it's not, we shouldn't um, over or under emphasize 
uh, the use value of some disgusting processes. If we can accept this man who wants to put fish in his butt, we can accept genetic engineering. I think it's okay. And look, it's also partly natural uh, and beautiful. <laughs> uh, so back to getting people to get their hands dirty. I'm not sure what I'm doing. It's kind of like a Milgram experiment without the white jacket and the authoritarian complex where I'm like, you can, you don't have to. I'm not yelling at you to do it some more. And people still, they do tend to say like, well, let me get my hands on there. I can touch this. We did this at a concert at Lowlands, right? And people were in bathing suits, drinking their uh, sugar water, micro-injecting zebrafish. Um, we had a nice setup with a little micro-injector and a little TV screen. And the whole idea was that people came along, they could micro-inject, they'd watch it on the screen. Some people would react and uh, we would then put them in the aerarium, which we're going to tour after lunch. Um, now, a big question. Is GMO geoengineering for photosynthetic vertebrate enhancement, am I just greenwashing, along with everybody else, a sort of corporate agenda to keep the money in the big guys? Because we've talked a lot about community, but community projects may happen, and they're great examples of small, but we have 200 plus years of late capitalism to go and we're not gonna stop late capitalism until the environment stops late capitalism, right? It's not going away real fast. Um, so what am I doing making GMOs and trying to get them in a museum? Um, to some extent, I mean, we have to look at these monsters that we've invented and understand that swamp thing, which I would love to help engineer, um, is actually, an environmentalist. He, w he was a part of a community known as the Green that was connected to life and the planet and fought for justice. Um, this sounds weird, but I relate to these algae, even though they're engineered, even though they should be in containment, I kind of feel them as organisms, not as factories to produce pharmaceuticals, not as, I guess this is what, not as just utilizable nature, but also as beings. Maybe not conscious in the way we know it, but complex with societies, um, with gene expression patterns that respond to the environment. Maybe in emotional ways, if we can't talk about logic with them, but I think we might be able to talk about chemotaxis. You know, communication is possible, and that's part of the reason I set up the aerarium, is so people could communicate on a nonverbal light and sound um, way with non-humans. Um, who are these zebrafish? Right? Besides workhorses whose genome is sequenced that we can utilize. And are we frightened by them because of xenophobia? So in other words, like the reason that we call them foreign species is because they are not of us or they are not uh, wild creatures. But are introduced, is the introduction of GM into the environment actually um, a way of opening up? Maybe like I was talking to Jeremy about queering. I mean... Let's talk about foreign invasive species and immigration, right? Um, another way to talk about it, and that's, don't forget I do accentuate, <laughs> accentuate the risks, but um, is that I've taught courses on, on non-human, animal and non-human enrichment, and this is actually to keep organisms from going insane in captivity. So we might think about this because our pharmaceuticals are produced by organisms that are in high stress. And if we enrich these organisms, then we might get better results from the mice and rats, assuming that humans aren't under high stress as well. Many of us are strapped to the same timetables as these organisms, right? We are also workhorses. And so maybe the pharmaceuticals work better on people that are um, agitated because both the model organisms and the humans are being affected. In any case, back to the beauty of red tide. I, I tried to create a red tide by releasing some GMO zebrafish, these um, glowfish that are legal in Texas. I went to Corpus Christi um, and released these sort of like five males and five females that I bought in a pet store. And the idea was to make a red, a red tide of glowing zebrafish that could be seen from space so that to, to sort of, you know, say hi to Castro. And unfortunately, BP dropped the bomb there and came up with that 
big deep water horizon spill and probably killed all my GM release people. Um, but one of the questions I had for BP besides like, why did you kill my art with your art was, is corporate culture, is massified, industrialized, basically futurist, emancipated, how do I say, um, overcoming of regulation, free enterprise, a performance art practice? Right? And if it is, is it also much like Artaud's theater of cruelty, where the Deepwater Horizons oil spill was actually just a big performance about like what, how badly can we screw up the earth? Because it's, it's almost all we can do. I'm not sure if we can do as much good as we can do as much harm. We'll see. That's pretty cynical. Uh, along with re reduce, reuse, uh, and recycle, I just want to remind people that also they should rewild not just the organisms outside in the world, but themselves. And this is to say, when it comes to sustainability, we cannot rely on utility, progress, optimization, and austerity all at the same time. But we actually have to focus on abundance. Uh, I don't know how to explain this except for there is more energy available than we're harnessing, but there is also a real need to think of sustainable ways to be excessive, okay, because people are excessive. And if we're just trying to get everybody, including our organisms that we force into work, to not express themselves because it's bad for the environment, that's ridiculous, okay? And so we should have parties that add fertility to the, to the world, as opposed to tightening up and recycling and scrimping and getting everybody to save their tin for the war effort. Um, unfortunately, becoming wild is really, really complicated. It, you know, you could become more free and you could become more insane. You could become more violent and you could become less guilty. You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty confusing. And if you become too wild, then we're going back to pharma. And some of this algae is going to be producing Thorazine, which will probably get into the, not just the water table, but now the petroleum replacement table. We'll be burning a little of the extra pharma that we produced in our algae. In any case, I like to see animals happy, even when they're in captivity. Um, this is a better picture than, say, this ad for dental floss, <laughs> right? Which has the animal between your teeth, and you're supposed to sort of pick it out. Um, and we did do some stuff on, on eugenics. We had, we had four biosolar cells. We had a sort of beauty contest at at um, Hortus Botanicus in Leiden, of these different um, mutants. And we, we had people sort of try to read them. And funnily, both artists and art historians have much more problem reading mutants than, say, uh, environmentalists and people that work with um, ecology that are an especially plant molecular biologist. Am I close? Oh, look at that. OK, so let's stop here. I think we'll. I have a few more slides that basically start to explain the biosolar cells work that I've been doing. So maybe when we come back after lunch <laughs> and after taking a look at the aerarium and giving it a try, um, we can talk more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam, very much uh, for your talk.